Episode 208 of the Outdoor Biz Podcast with Kurt Gauss of GSI, brought to you by Liberty Lake Design Works. When I'm looking for an innovative marketing approach, packaging design, catalog, and web development, I call outdoor industry veteran Marty Heaster at Liberty Lake Design Works. Marty has gathered a team of experienced outdoor industry freelancers providing expertise across a broad range of marketing services. Visit Liberty Lake Design Works to discover how collaborating today's technologies with talented teams delivers brand success. I believe achieving success in the outdoor biz is dependent upon embracing the outdoor lifestyle and learning from outdoor leaders that came before you. If you agree, then listen up for tips, advice, and hacks about growing or starting your career in the outdoor biz. My name is Rick Says. Welcome to the Outdoor Biz Podcast. So I've been hearing from retailers, brands, outfitters, and others that one of the challenges they face these days is engaging with new and existing customers. You post on all the socials, public, publish articles, blogs, videos in order to grab attention, and the response is, eh, maybe not, let's just say not what you hoped. Today, a better option is a podcast, and you might think you don't have the time or the budget or the talent to produce one, but I think you do, and I'll show you how. A podcast will give you broader reach to an unlimited amount of customers and a clear opportunity to meaningfully impact a huge number of people. So if you're curious about podcasting, visit podcastersworkshop.com slash brainstorm, and let's jump on a call and talk about it. Today's guest is one of our outdoor design wizards making the cool product we just can't live without. He has degrees in design from Notre Dame and the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. He's taught product design and led undergraduate and postgraduate programs of electrical and electronic robotics and product design at the University of the West of England. And he's led the design efforts for over 13 years at GSI Outdoors. Kurt Gauss, welcome to the Outdoor Biz Podcast. Hey, Rick. Nice to nice to hear from you. Yeah, good to catch up with you. I spent a little bit of time with you at the OR at the end last day. That was pretty crazy, but it was always fun to get together. Yeah, always crazy and, and busy and noisy. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Was it a good show for you guys? It was huge. Um, we had our, our new, uh, the ultra thin, uh, pinnacle pro stove there. Oh, and, right. um, that got a lot of, a lot of attention and snagged a couple of awards and nice. that's always fun. That was a, a project that, oh, geez, I've been working on that project probably for over four years. Wow. Um, yeah. With the, uh, the original mandate coming from one of the owners saying, make me a stove that's thinner than a MacBook air. Oh, wow. That's and, a- and, you know, well, well, cool premise. Yeah, um, cool specific direction. Yeah. Yeah. Thermodynamically, darn near impossible. Wow. Um, so, so had to bone up on how to design for, for hot heat and, mm-hmm. and gas and combustion. And uh, I'd done some smaller backpacking stoves. Um, so I had a, a background in it, but um, and ne- never anything this complicated. Well, and you nailed so we nailed it. Broke, yeah, we broke some barriers and uh, it, it'll be in the stores in uh, July, probably right June, July. Right so on. that's cool. That's right around yeah. the corner. Oh, yeah. 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 So how did you get introduced to the outdoors, hiking and camping? Oh. And all that? Uh, well, um, uh, my, my father grew up on a farm and his idea of vacation, you know, summer vacation property was to buy a farm. And so much to my mother's chagrin, he bought a farm. <laughs> did, <laughs> we're going where? Wanted, yeah. My mom kind of wanted the lake house in, uh, <laughs> you know, North of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and, but he got the farm. And so wow. from, yeah, from Memorial day through labor day, uh, we were basically dropped off and I had three older siblings and, and we had 70 plus acres just to roam oh, and cool. tree forts and camps and teepees and sweat lodges and ponds and fishing and, and Jeez, all that. How fun is that? Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty fun. And, and, and also learning, you know, the trade of farming and cause oh, I okay. did hay bales when I was a teenager and uh, that was good, good hard work. Yeah. And, in mucked out barns and, and stuff like that. So you get over some of your phobias <laughs> really quickly <laughs> when you work on a farm. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Did you guys also grow veggies and stuff? Uh, we didn't. Well, we had, yeah, we had our, our family veg uh, plot, and which was probably, uh, you know, 20 yards by 20 yards or gotcha. something like that. Um, and you know, the biggest challenge there is to keep the rabbits out and the deer out <laughs> and the deer and so out, right? Lots, yeah, lots of chicken wire. <laughs> and, uh, but, um, about a quarter of the farm actually was working, uh, fields. And so oh. we would actually lease the fields out to our neighboring farms 
and uh, they would grow alfalfa and corn and mm. um, you know rotate crops through that and cool. and then the rest of the land was just went from bog up to forest and uh, wow. yeah a really pretty part of Wisconsin the Kettle Moraine uh, yeah. up near Plymouth if any of you know about Plymouth Wisconsin it's, it used to be the cheese capital of the world. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. I'm, few fo- I'm sure a few of our outdoor listeners know about that. All the folks yeah. that live up there in, in uh, yeah. Green Bay and Appleton. <laughs> yeah, us better heads. That's right. Know. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, and then uh, I'll just continue. Yeah. continue. And then after that, um, uh, when I was in my late teens, my dad had sold the farm and uh, we got interested in sailing again. My dad oh. had sailed a bit and he bought a little 17 foot day sailor and we kept it down at the. Uh, community sailing center in Milwaukee. And, uh, basically I would play on that boat and, um, I lucked into a job at the yacht club running, um, the race committee. Wow. And, um, so very soon after that, I started to get invited onto people's boats and I learned the trade of racing sailboats. And, cool. and then I started teaching sailing and, uh, I really fell in love with the whole mechanism of teaching. Mm-hmm. And, and what that offers. And so lots of lots of time spent on a farm and lots of time spent on the water and uh, still hold those really near and dear. Well, yeah, that'll solidify your love for the outdoors. That's for sure. And that yeah. kind of ex- explains a little bit about the education and background, because my next question was, you have an impressive product design and education background. What, what inspired that? Was it the learning how to the aspect of teaching when you were teaching sailing? Yeah, uh, that certainly um, was super rewarding. I also come from a, a family of educators. My mm, okay. uh, siblings are educators. And so um, very, very quickly saw how that went and how rewarding that is. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, so so very quickly on, um, I was uh, in uh, an apprenticeship in an architecture studio and I met up with uh, one of their uh, architects, and he was uh, going to Illinois Institute of Technology and, you know, studying to become a, a university professor. And, oh. and that planted the seed way back in my head. Gotcha. That, all right, I'm going to go for my undergraduate, and then I'm going to go for my postgrad, and I'm going to teach in the university someday. Very cool. And that led me down the track. Um, the path, and, yeah. and well, you want me to tell you the whole story? I sure. can play that. Sure. Yeah. So, um, I did my undergraduate and uh, three years into the profession, my uh, boss said, Kurt, it's time for you to go and do follow your dreams. And you're really valuable here, but uh, I don't, I can't offer you much more and Milwaukee's not going to offer you much more. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I cast my, my net out to uh, post-grad schools and University of Notre Dame hired me as adjunct faculty. And wow. and the great thing about that is there was no tuition and I got a paycheck. So <laughs> that's great. Yeah. I was able to come out of my post-grad degree with my, all my student loans actually paid wow, off. Wow. Very cool. That's great. Huge. That's significant. And, and, yeah. Yeah. And then I, I got a job at the University of uh, Wisconsin uh, Stout and uh, for a year. And then very quickly during that year, I found out about a, a technical degree uh, college in Montreal that wanted to start up the first English-speaking um, product design program in, in French-speaking Canada. Oh. And uh, I was hired. And wow. so I immigrated to Canada, got my citizenship, learned wow. French, and because all the paperwork in the government came in French, <laughs> and built a program. Huh. And and that must because, be fun. Oh, it was huge. I mean, uh, yeah, it was really good. Yeah. Um, and you know, hired the people, bought all the equipment, went yeah. through all the uh, professional association approval process, and and it was it, it still is a fantastic program. It's yeah. thriving to this day. Cool. Um, Dawson College. Um, and then during that time, um, I I didn't want to just become one of those professors that doesn't practice. And so um, because of the way Dawson College was set up, they they said you can do empirical research like lab research or you can professionally practice. And if you mm. professionally practice uh, for tenureship, your track will be patents oh, wow. instead of having to do theoretical papers right. and stuff like that. So you that have something valuable to walk away with at the end. Yeah. Right. And so I started a little uh, collaborative called the Gauss Group. And um 
it was a bunch of my friends that were out in the field and a couple of students that had just graduated. And we, we did projects and we professionally practiced and had, you know, a thriving design firm group for, you know, four or five years until I, I moved on to, uh, Spokane. Mm-hmm. But uh, no, it was, it was great. And, you know, one of those projects was uh, the medical appliances. Well, actually, three of them were medical appliances. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, and I was just going to ask you about that. So that's how you got into the, that work. That's great. Yeah. Well, you're, at, you're working for a, a, a college yeah. and then other R&Ds uh, at other universities and colleges, you know, know of you. And mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's not that hard to think that they're going to call you up and sure. at least ask for a consultation. And so right away, I got involved in designing the appliances with uh, Nike Bauer and oh. University of McGill and University of Montreal. And, mm-hmm. you know, to rub shoulders with indus- industrialists and, you know, amazing researchers yeah. uh, and, and to take their dreams and ideas and concerns and turn them into product, a viable product that's yeah. patentable and marketable um, is, uh, again, was just an amazing opportunity. And well, so, and knee products, I mean, and, and the functionality and the tolerances you've got to, you know, build into those things. I mean, that, that just solidified your experience in ways that I bet you still call on today. Yeah, you know, what it taught me is this empirical love of mine for engineering solutions. Mm -hmm. And and that really had centered me um, with, excuse me, (coughs) with how I approached design Mm -hmm. um, and how at Dawson College I was teaching and formed the program to to go towards design. And it's just not pretty pictures. It's just not pretty sketches (laughs) or drawings or computer renderings. And you have to build things, one, that work, and and two, that that hopefully, you know, uh, not only solve the functional aspects of what the design needs are, but also fill in the emotional aspects. Yeah, I mean, fixing some, I mean, I I need a knee replacement and I, I, for years have needed it, but I can't imagine what it does for someone mentally as well as physically. I know what it'll do physically, but mentally it's just got to, you know, oh, that's not going to hurt anymore. I can do this now. That's got to be really significant. Right. So so one of the knee braces was fun because it was a prophylactic, and that means it uh, doesn't actually uh, do anything for you under a normal use. But if someone were to hit you or right. check you, the yeah. hockey player or field hockey player, um, it would protect you. It'd take the hit for you. Right. And, and there's a whole bucket of emotional things around there. When you're <laughs> an athlete that's earning, you know, millions of dollars a year yeah. and some take you out. Yeah. And, yeah. and what is that to have this very, uh, this appliance on your leg, that's going to be able to take the shot for you. Yeah. And, um, and yet from an engineering design point of view, you have everyone has their own it's called pathology their own your leg moves differently than my leg our mm-hmm. bones are mm-hmm. different so how do you build a brace that's not a custom workup for everyone right. that actually can be adjusted to everyone's pathology and moves exactly as their move, leg moves without putting any kind of odd movement into it causing injury that was a trick yeah you know, i can imagine yeah it's uh, i've got two of them and you guys did a great job i don't know who i don't know if one were inspired by your work but yeah it's amazing what they do I mean, it just, cool. yeah, takes the weight, takes the load off and there's no pain. And yep. of course it's gotten worse over the years. I don't ski anymore, but I used to wear braces all the time just so I could ski. So yeah, yeah. very cool. And so you've had a couple of different stints at GSI with some academic work in between at the University of the West of England. Tell our listeners about that. Yeah, yeah. So how it happened is, uh, obviously, uh, we've talked about the love of teaching. Yeah. And um, I was teaching at Dawson College and running that program before I came to GSI. And I say, actually, GSI was one of my uh, clients when I was oh, okay. running the Gauss Group. And so I consulted for with uh, GSI Outdoors for about three, four years before I actually moved in-house and, and took took the bite to actually step away from teaching after a decade and a couple of years um, and to go into and do a deep dive into industry and uh, join this fantastic young company with a really fun ownership Mm -hmm. and um, build the brand and build through design. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Johnny Ives talks about this with Apple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the top fortune 500 companies, they grow through design. They don't grow through 
uh, sales right. and they don't go through advertising. You know, those support great design. Yeah. And so here, here's this, you know, GSI Outdoors, a small company that does cookware and known for its enamelware, right? And we introduced design and we saw the company grow and grow and grow consecutively and win awards and win <laughs> awards through, you know, basically the crash 2010. Uh -huh. um, and coming into that, crash i had married and had uh we had two sons and one was uh 2008 nine was uh four months five months old and the other was two months and five months old mm. and um uh my both my wife and i had lived abroad and we thought it'd be a really cool time while the children are still very young mm -hmm. before they have strong friendships with people um, with their classmates and stuff, right. uh, it'd be a fun time to you know see if we could do something and and move abroad and and you know live that expat life. So I cast my net out for teaching jobs um, mm -hmm. because I'd been now professionally practicing uh, with GSI for uh, almost ten years, and I thought, oh, okay, I've kind of got this decade got worth of teaching yeah. going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see what teaching is going to be like. Right. And uh, I, I interviewed with a, a couple of universities and the one that popped up and offered me a position um, that would really work well with the family was the University of West of England um, uh, because it spoke English. And so we wouldn't have a, a language barrier, mm -hmm. although I speak French in, in English. My wife, only speaks English, and she, with two babies, she didn't want to take on a language yeah, too. Mm -hmm. That would have been really a challenge. Yeah. And and so we um, we moved to England almost sight unseen. And oh, wow. uh, it was, yeah, it was it was just this crazy thing that we did. <laughs> and um, we we landed in Bristol, and uh, Bristol is this amazing town that is seated. Um, in commerce and banking, okay. uh, its history uh, from the Roman days, uh -huh. it's never really had industry. It's 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 uh, a banking town, hmm. and then it also is a tech hub like Silicon Valley. Oh, okay. And it also is an art hub for really avant-garde art oh, like uh, okay. Banksy and uh, uh, other other big art trends. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. uh, hip hop comes from Bristol. Huh. Uh, as a music scene. And so you have this creative pulse in this town and you have this tech pulse with Airbus and Boeing wow. and Microsoft and Apple. Johnny Ives lives up the street, you know, oh, kind wow. of. Yeah. And, and then you have banking and you put those three together and Man, you're going to have this, uh, a really fertile ground for some yeah. amazing projects to work on. And so we are able to, um, in, in the programs that I led, we were always able to get professional projects in the door and get mm. the students really amazing educational experiences. And, and therefore, you know, they would come out of their university programs and into great positions and, and really be design leaders um, in their own right in England. And yeah. it, was a, it was a great, great um, uh time there and was it very entrepreneurial would it, people go out and start businesses launch companies yeah based? yeah that'd be pretty cool too yeah you know the the because we we taught some design management classes i'm specifically um i i managed a couple of programs mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and i taught in the product design program um but um you know we we taught also design management and marketing and so these students had not a deep knowledge but a really a, a good idea of yeah. All right. I'm go what I'm going to do is I'm going to work for a company, and then two or three years later, I'm going to step out on my own. And very they, cool. They they do that, and they're very successful. And um, so yeah, and and the university itself, it's um, located uh, on the old Filton Air Base, um, which uh, is where Airbus started. Okay. Um, and so it has this uh, aer aeronautics aviation history behind it. it. Used to be a polytechnic, so mm. it's very strong in the technical fields. And um, yeah, it, it was a perfect match for yeah. someone with my kind of engineering-based product design approach to come into a program and and push. Now we do real world 
world design here, not pretty pictures. Right, and, right. Um, well, it must have know, been we fun, do- too, for your family and your kids. I mean, being around all oh, those yeah. young, creative people and, and having the you know the banking business there to help support financially. What a blast. Man, I can't imagine. And and just the, the whole history. And yeah, England right, right. It's really about history. And right. every weekend we go out to a national trust, right. and explore and camping and traveling up to Scotland and over to visit friends in London and Wales. And, you know, everything's so close. It's a couple hour drive away, but you know, cool. it's, it's really cool. So how did GSI lure you back from that? Really interesting. Um, <laughs> they always said, there's a door open here, Kurt. We know that you love to teach and you, we we totally understand what you want to do with your family and that this is time for you to do it. Um, I don't know if they're really happy <laughs> about seeing me walk out <laughs> yeah, in right. Right. but uh, without necessarily knowing if I'm going to come back. But they always had the door open and, and um about three years in, Sarah and I were, my wife, uh, we were thinking, yeah, I think we want to actually start looking at returning to uh, the Pacific Northwest area and either Canada or the United States. And um, where would we want to go? And so we did the pros and cons thing that everyone does. Yeah, you know? yeah. And and we looked at each other and go, Spokane? <laughs> <laughs> we could move anywhere we want. And, and when we left Spokane, well, I'll, I'll back up. When we came to Spokane, Sarah came to Spokane as a Gonzaga uh, University uh, student, and mm-hmm. I came to Spokane uh, after Dawson College. And around around 2000, Spokane was just starting to move, mm-hmm. and, and its art scene was just starting, and its craft beer and whiskey and wine was mm-hmm. just starting to come on. And it, you know, it has universities there, and it has hospitals, and you know, it has all the elements. It was just starting to come on by 2010 it was starting to really roll and then the recession came in. And then when we came back, when we decided to come back, it had really started to move and it's, mm. you know, really, really becoming a very cool town yeah. with that. That's so close to the outdoors. You know, there's, there's 50 lakes, 50 rivers, 50 mountains within 50 miles. Oh, cool. Yeah. No, that's a great spot. I mean, for outdoor stuff, if you want to go do anything outdoors, Spokane is a great hub. You're right. Yeah. So I had the door open to me and um, basically uh, the the position was to um, you know, lead up the design team um, mm-hmm. and that's graphic and uh, product mm-hmm. and engineering and um, all the marketing and and wow. the marketing from a brand position. Um, and I collaborate on the marketing with uh, director of sales. And so he kind of takes a lot of the, the sales issues around the marketing, the sell through, and I take all the branding aspects gotcha. of it. And I like method. that way that's that set up. That makes a lot of sense. It does, um, especially if you're really trying to have a design led yeah. uh, yeah, company. Yeah. Um, and and granted, we all have to you know make sales. And so sure. The, yeah. At the, the end of the day, it's got to go out the door. It's yeah. Product. Yeah. Um, it's, you just can't bomb your company by having these great <laughs> branding initiatives without sales to back them up. Right. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity. So it was kind of easy. Um, yeah. And uh, we knew where to, we knew the town, you know, when you right. move into a new town, it takes you years to adjust, but sure. we knew it. Yeah. And so it, it was easy for the family, easy for GSI mm-hmm. and it just made sense. Very so cool. We yeah. yeah. Well, let's, Let's shift gears a little bit and talk yeah. about, um, <clears throat> I love how your products just function and work together. You know, I, I originally went to school to study architecture and never continued on with it. So I have that in my background, but y- you know, your products just, they, I would use your new coffee setup over the weekend and it's just like, it's ah. tight, it's clean, it works. It's, you know, it doesn't take up a lot of space in your pack. It's just great. So how do you, where do your ideas come from? How does that, where does that design? Wow. Well, <laughs> funny you say that. Um, <laughs> Uh, and they're very pragmatic. Um, what we really did is we looked at the value proposition for um, the people that were using our gear. Now, GSI, we make cookware and we make hydration stuff, bottles mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So um, when you're going out and hiking, you have to basically uh, carry water and you have to carry your cookware, right? And, right. and then you have your plates, cups, and bowls. And, and 
aside from that little Boy Scout aluminum mess kit, which was kind of awful, um, <laughs> uh, that we all grew up with, right? Everything stuck. We all had one of those. Yep. <laughs> you know, we all had one of those. Uh, there hadn't been a lot of really this infilling. And, and so the idea came about that if we could um, start with a fuel canister and a stove and wrap a bowl, a cup around that mm -hmm. or a mug around that, and then put a bowl around that and then put a fork knife spoon in that and then put that into a pot and put that pot into actually a bag that could be dual purposed as a water carrier mm -hmm. or, or a kitchen sink. You start to win. You start to increase the value proposition because now you're getting more function for less space. Right, big time. And, yeah. and the materials are materials, right? So yeah. polypropylene weighs what it weighs, and aluminum weighs what it weighs, and yeah. and works really well. And so if the materials are pretty straightforward, but it really comes down to the design and the utility of the design. Yeah. And and so we started infilling, and um, that 2008. Uh, do a list award backpackers award mm -hmm. was a great confirmation that we're on the right track here. And then we kind of rolled that out into pots and pans and their funny little anecdotal story about MSR coming over to us and, <laughs> and, and, and admitting, yes, we were inspired by your design. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, nice of them to come over and tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and they're good. Yeah. They're, they're, they're good, good guys. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're, yeah. They're great guys. Yeah. And, you know, we all, we all laugh about it because of course, you know, we're looking at each other right. and it, it's all good competition. Um, it drives us all to be better. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and, and so that, that basically really branded GSI as this, they're the people to put everything inside everything, like the Metro Troika Russian dolls, you know, the right, yep, that yep. Um, and and then we in 2009, I did this silicone collapsible cup uh, with a lid on it, and uh, other people were inspired by that design and they did their product lines. And uh, we came back to that in 2016 and uh, did a pot with a, one of the radiators or a heat sink on the mm, bottom. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what that does is that um, instead of trying to infill, that collapses down flat, obviously, so it creates a different way of high-density packing. Mm -hmm. So bottom line is you can get more value in less space. You're not carrying a house on your back. Exactly. Uh, and and you're going to be more comfortable in the outdoors. Yeah, right? and you use lightweight materials. And yeah, no, it's just it's. Has, was there any any individual person who influenced your or inspired your design style, or is it just all the backpackers and your experience in the outdoors? Well, yeah, it's funny. I, I've always been attracted to Dieter Rams, mm. and and he's a design icon. He's very straightforward. You know, many people out there have been the whole Bauhaus. Um, you know, the clean and purity of lines and uh, form and function. Um, not the form follows function or function follows form, um, mm -hmm. but it's and function. Yeah. Um, so, so that cleanliness and then just my pragmatic approach that I really start from the engineering solution. And then I, I work out from there um, into uh, what the brand wants to align with as mm -hmm. a brand and aesthetic. So, so we look at the, the, you know, the, the brand value points for right. utility and, solve those and then we go into the brand styling that's great yeah and, and, and that's just the way i do it other people do it the opposite way there's probably no right or wrong i just think it's easier to solve the engineering before we step into the actual aesthetics yeah yeah no that makes sense yeah no there is no right or wrong you're right there's a bunch of ways to, to slice that apple um have you had any mentors sp that worked with you uh, interesting i've had very few people mm -hmm. that um have mentored me like you know been the the type of person that can advise me through my yeah. career mm -hmm. although i've been a mentor for many students and, mm -hmm. and young professionals um there was one uh professor at the university of bristol um uh, when i was at the university of west of england and we were doing a collaborative uh, project to bring our schools together into the bristol institute of creative technology and this this was like a a bell labs of the forties and fifties where oh, you cool. put technology and artists and industrialists all in the same room. And you just do this, these, this crazy projects <laughs> involving uh, AR and uh, you know, computer technology that David May brought in and uh, his group from the university of Bristol and my electronics and robotics and wow. product design from UE. And, 
it would have been great. Um, it never came to fruition, mm-hmm. but during those years that I was working with him, he was so inspiring and so great in his counsel that I would say that he was he was probably my mentor while I was in uh, England. Gotcha, and mm-hmm. a really cool person. That's good. Yeah, it's good yeah. to have someone like that. Yeah. So you must be outside all the time. Do you have a couple ha. of favorite spots? Not out. We're never. Nobody's outside enough, is how I feel. But you get. You must get out to test products and test ideas. And do you have any favorite spots you like to go to? Uh, yeah. Well, um, certainly. Um, in my outside time. I've. I have two young boys. Uh, young, eleven and thirteen, oh, coming cool. up. And uh, we mountain bike and we ski yeah. and we love it. And uh, there's a local ski area. I'm sorry, local mountain biking area called Beacon Hill, okay. just on the. Uh, just outside of downtown. It's so easy to get to. I mean, a 10 minute drive from my house. That's great. And it has you know, miles of mountain biking. Um, and so we do that uh, pretty much eight months of the year. Mm-hmm. And uh, when we're not doing that during the summer months, we're hiking in the Pacific Northwest. And, mm-hmm. and um, uh, yeah, I, sometimes we get out to the um, Bellevue area and we do some sailing. So oh, cool. Fun. So you do a lot of cool. different stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then in the winter we Nordic ski and we alpine ski, cool. and because we're in the Pacific Northwest, you know we have plenty of that around. Yeah. Mount Spokane has a, a great little community mountain and a community uh, alpine and in Nordic ski area, and uh, yeah, Spokane Nordic Ski Association. I volunteer for them. And, oh, cool! Uh, yeah, that's fun. Like yeah, that. is there any place you haven't been to that you'd like to go visit? Uh, South time? America. South America. Oh, yeah. yeah. Where in you South know. America? Well, of course, everyone says Chile, right? You yeah. Get yeah. Down, you get down towards Patagonia yeah. and you know, start to see those that kind of stuff down there. Um would be really, really an amazing adventure. But uh, we're going to have to brush up on our Spanish before then. <laughs> well, they speak a lot of English down there. I was down there. I, we went down, spent some time in Santiago, and then went to uh, Antarctica. Spent some time in uh, Ushuaia before we left. And you're right. That is just it's. It reminds me of the Sierra a lot. Actually, it's pretty rugged country. There's just a wide variety of terrain to go visit, and I I want to go back because I was just traveling through to get to Ushuaia to get on the boat. I didn't see much of it, but yeah, it's just amazing. And so you do a lot of outdoor activities. You sail, you ski, you hike. Any climbing or? Uh, yeah, well, we haven't done much rope climbing. Um, yeah. uh, we have the kit, um, but uh, it just. You know, how do you fit it all in? It's, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's hard. Uh, what what we do do, um, most of my skiing uh, on Saturdays is I lead um, a 10 to 15 year old uh, cl- uh, a class called Spokane Nordic Rangers. Oh, cool. And it's for our local Nordic Ski Association. And it's, it's basically uh, for 10 to 15 year olds and to teach them um, navigation, snow science, uh, shelter and uh first aid oh wow and so it's kind of an introduction to what ski patrol would be or also just really a good way to learn how to be safe in the winter in the pacific northwest oh that's huge no science uh covers avalanche first aid covers you know group dynamics and failure uh failure chain analysis and navigation where you got to know where you are even if you don't know how to use a compass you know all the tricks to a line of sight and how to read topo maps and wow, yeah. and then shelter building is what everyone enjoys the most it's like how to build <laughs> a fire in snow and with yeah. wet wood and how to actually do a really quick shelter and and then do really elaborate igloos and stuff like that. And so oh, it, fun. It, it's a great, it's a great class. Yeah. And, and then, yeah, of course, Nordic skiing, skate skiing, Alpine skiing, backcountry skiing. I used to do before kids and <laughs> get back into a little bit as they get older, but it the stakes are too high. It, mm, yeah. Yeah. Gets, yeah. You know, and then, like I said, just hiking around the Pacific Northwest. We're planning a, a hike in Stahican, uh, Lake Chelan area, and the, the, early this summer. And then sailing, of course, whenever I can get sailing, I sail, on, whether it's Pend Oreille or Bruce Lake or on the ocean. That's great. That's great. Sounds like a great life. Do you have any suggestions or advice for folks wanting to get into the outdoor? Is. That's a great, yeah. That's a great question. I get asked that a lot. Mm-hmm. Obviously, um, people are asking me for internships often. Oh, right. Um, uh, 
Well, you know, there's two sides of the outdoor business. There's the sales side and customer service side and right. this is the design side. And so if you want to get into the sales side, my advice is get a job, an entry-level job in a customer service. Um, mm. uh, and uh, that's going to be taking care of, uh, you know, either end customers or buyers uh, for, um, you know, your accounts like REI and such right. like that. Yep. And what that teaches you, that teaches you a whole whole lot about the business. It teaches you about the issues of you know closing a sale and customer support after the sale, yeah. and that whole ecology and ecosystem there. Um, and then, if you want to get into design, um, a lot of people say, "Oh, I love the outdoor world. I want to get a design. I want to get an internship in a design uh, <laughs> office in the outdoor." And that that really casts a very very small net. Yeah, very small net. And I would say, you know, most of the people I've hired have had experience not in the outdoor industry. They've right. had broader experience, which is actually from a design director's point of view, what you want. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, what kind of skills from designing washing machines in Kalamazoo, Michigan, can you bring to GSI? Exactly. Yeah. There's something there. Yeah. That that wouldn't be there if it was an incestuous move from moving from, say, MSR to GSI or right, something like right. that. Yeah, that's a good point. So, so really look for look for internships and and for me, from an again design director's point of view, get an internship. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Whether it's a non paid internship during the summer or a paid internship after graduation, where you're just getting basically minimum wage and um, you know doing the scut work. Yeah, um, that is what I want to see. I want to see how you work with people. Mm -hmm. I want to. Uh, and and what you do with your time as a, a person working in a in a group, and yeah. how you can talk about that right. and bring that experience forward. Um, it's a, a lot about group dynamics in a creative world, and so you want to make sure that that person that you'd be looking at has had some experience in a design firm. Yeah, no, that's um, great advice. I tell people the same thing. I mean, I used to tell people a lot of times wanting to get into sales. You know, you got to go work retail if you have no retail background. You know. Yeah, exactly. Same Seeing thing. what the customer does first, yep. you can't help us. So, yeah. 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 That's good. And and that retail would obviously support if you wanted to get into customer sale, service and how sale customer yeah, exactly. and work retail at an REI, of course, that's just going to be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so you get out a lot. Do you have any other daily routines to keep your sanity? Do you meditate? Yeah. You, yeah. yeah. Uh, my wife and I do our, we wake up at four thirty, five o'clock and do our morning yoga cool. together while the house is still quiet. Yeah. And, uh, then, um, I have this, we adopted this crazy dog. It's <laughs> this 14. We did the DNA test on her and she's got like, I don't know, my, I probably have the number wrong, but 10 different mixes in her oh, from wow. great pyrenees to pit bull to border collie wow. to on and on and on but she she kind of looks like a border collie lab mix and okay, cool. uh, but she it seems that she only has one speed setting and that's <laughs> full on especially if she sees a cat a squirrel or a skunk oh, she even no. kicks the hyper gear oh, no. and this dog <laughs> <laughs> you can't tire her out, yeah. Wow. So there's usually a morning run instead of a walk, which I'd rather <laughs> do in the morning with her. And um, and then uh, certainly uh, there's all the weekend things, and our weekends are pretty full. And Sounds like it. Yeah. We we try to fit some bike maintenance in and some house maintenance in, mm -hmm. but that oftentimes this gets trumped to the pursuit. And yeah, that makes sense. Yes. Like, ah, uh, yeah, no, we didn't need to clean the chains. So let's let's go up right. Yeah, yeah, we can do that later. <laughs> yeah, we can do that later. Uh, how about podcasts or books? Do you give books as gifts very often, or some of your favorite books? Uh, I I don't give books as gifts. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I I read kind of to escape. Yeah, and mm -hmm. so um, uh, and the, you know. Uh, so yeah, I, I kind of stumble over that question. You That's know, okay. I'll, I'll go for a, a sci-fi novel mm -hmm. or a, a, a spy thriller that just takes me away. Mm -hmm. And um, and then podcasts. Well, um, you know, because of my love of sailing, I love to listen to wooden boat building podcasts. Oh, cool! Yeah, and sailing adventure podcasts. Mm -hmm. These 
these people that are taking their families or taking themselves around the world and, and doing that. That's just living vicariously and right. you know, for them. And TED Talks, I love TED Talks mm-hmm. and, and yeah. your program. It's great. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, working in the working in Spokane can be a little isolating. It's yeah, not like yeah. Seattle, where there's design firms around, and so mm-hmm. if I can network vicariously mm-hmm. and hear what's going on with other people, that's great because we don't get time to do that when we're at OR. Yeah, no, that's you're right. We don't. We're so busy. Yeah. Have you been to the Wooden Boat Festival? I have not. Oh, but, you got uh, to go Fort to Thompson that. is where I'd like to retire. For oh, sure. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've got to go to that. I went up there one time to visit a buddy of mine who lived there for many, many years, and that was going on. Man, that some of the the work, you know, design and craftsmanship and that thing is amazing. Beautiful work, beautiful boats. Yeah, yeah, yeah I love certainly. it. Yeah. So, what's your favorite oh. outdoor gear purchase under a hundred dollars? Here's your chance oh, for a plug. Wow. <laughs> yeah, a chance for a plug. Yeah. Um, you know, so, or so I work in the company where fortunately I get R and D samples. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so take all of that stuff off the list. Yeah. Now what can and those are all things that are under hundred dollars. So I have to go and say that my my favorite purchase as of late, and it was a little more than a hundred dollars, is a pair of Solomon hiking boots. Okay. They, were fant and they still are mm-hmm. fantastic. They just work so well, and you know, boots are really personal things. Um, but uh, these just, cool. I look forward to putting my feet in these things. And yeah, I nice. Kind of said that about a lot of boots in my history. I'm yeah. the same. I'm the same. Yeah, I, I wear Solomon as well. Um, cool. If you had a huge banner at the entrance of outdoor retailer, what would it say? Well, I, I don't. Yeah. Um, Okay, I can't come up with the words of exactly what it would say, but uh-huh. I could tell you about what it would mean. And so I'd say you have to say something about reducing consumption and and the power of our buyers mm. in retail stores um, to purchase from informed brands that are leading in best practice ecologically and socially. Oh, I like it. Yeah. So, yeah. We got, you know, right now with COVID, we're really seeing our world just change. And yeah. you know, obviously before COVID came in, uh, the the big noise in the room, the big you know elephant in the room was our environment yeah. and how fast it is changing. And, you know, buyers have tremendous power to, you know, scrutinize a company and hold a company to accountability and not buy from a company right. that is not doing all that they can do right. to reduce the ecological uh, footprint, and and a little plug for GSI, and we are heavy into it. You know, mm-hmm. we often say that um, we are designing things. Uh, yeah, they're aluminum. Aluminum it, it takes a tremendous amount of power, so we're going to design it really well with tons of integrity and utility, and it's going to last for generations. Right. Yeah. You are going to your kids are going to have this, and maybe their kids. And then we win. Yeah, that's. And yeah. then, from a social point of view, of course, all our factories. You know, we audit our factories over and over and over again to make mm-hmm. sure that factory workers have the best working conditions and are paid fair wages. And you know, that's and great, and yeah. we're very very strict on that. And so, I think that there needs to be more companies like ours. And I um, think that the buyers are really the ones that are going to. Uh, yeah, that's a good point, and we're getting there. There's a, there's a long way yeah. to go, but we're getting there. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. Um, right. As we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to say to our listeners or ask of our listeners? Uh, yeah, it's just been really enjoyable to chat with you this morning. Yeah, thank and, you. It's uh, been great. Go, go through some of these uh, conversations. It's It's been good, yeah. It's always fun to hear everybody's history, yeah. And if people want to follow up with you, what's, how's the best way to reach out to you? Is it... Uh, yeah, well, um, I'll say Link, through LinkedIn. LinkedIn is cleanest or what? Yeah, LinkedIn is cleanest um, or they can, you know, call the GSI uh, main line. I can't have a lot of calls coming right into my right, office. I'm, right, You know, too busy for that. But LinkedIn would be the coolest way to okay, do it. Okay, cool. We'll put we'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile. Super. And, uh, well, thanks, Kurt. It's been great uh, chatting with you. I think you guys had a little something you wanted to give to listeners, too. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I just thought about that. Hey, if um, you're listening to this and you want to get a little bit of a promo code, um, you can uh, use the code word outdoor biz at our checkout and you'll receive a 10% off on orders over um, 
on your entire order and free shipping over $25. And that's through 430. Yeah, it's a little bit tib- tidbit to throw out there. Yeah, great. I appreciate that. Yeah, we'll go, go get some of this cool gear, you guys. It's uh, right. uh, like I said at the beginning, it's the stuff we can't live without. I love it. Well, keep up the great work and I will see you at the next outdoor if, unless I find Absolutely. my way to Spokane. Yeah, uh, stay healthy, Rick, and stay healthy, everyone else. Yeah, Take you care. too. Thanks, Kurt. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you want more of the Outdoor Biz Podcast, be sure and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcast. Be sure and go to the outdoorbizpodcast.com where you find all the episodes, show notes, and much, much more. Have a great week and be sure to get outside. <laughs>